you would move in hearts, move in minds this morning in maybe a way you have never moved in this church. We pray through the power of your spirit as Pastor Obi brings your word, dear God, you would encourage our hearts and renew our minds. I would ask again this morning as we come to this time of prayer, we come to this time where we hear your word, I pray before we leave here this morning, we'd find somebody and tell them we're going to pray for them this week. There have been so many things going on here this week, and there's so many things that go on each and every day in each and everyone's lives, dear God, that we don't know about, but you do. And I pray that we would be mindful of that, that we would pray for souls, we'd pray for hearts, we'd pray for lives, dear God. So in this moment, we give this time to you. In this moment, dear God, Holy Spirit, move, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Please be seated. Good to have you here. I just want to welcome you. If you are a guest, um, man, I just want to tell you what I've observed this week. So this has been kind of a hard week for our church, uh, but I've gotten to see a church family come around, multiple families who are going through difficult things. And I just want to encourage you, if you're a guest, you need a church family. Uh, Bad things are going to happen in this life, and you need people to walk through life with. And so I encourage you to that. Um, Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, if you've been following along with our First John study, you may be thinking, man, this guy's been here for like a month and he's just now on uh, chapter 2. And uh, I'm sorry if that was going too fast for you. I could slow down. I uh, will. <laughs> so 1 John chapter 2, and uh, we've been talking about eternal security and how to know that you are saved. Uh, maybe you've given your life to Christ and, and you've felt like you could rest in that and and then all of a sudden something happened in your life, or maybe you stumble back into an old sin, and um, whatever it was, you start to doubt your salvation. You start to have concerns about your salvation, and maybe you go through a cycle, a pattern, that sometimes you just feel like, I'm so on fire for Christ, and then other times you just feel like, um, I'm just, I've fallen away. I, I, am I really saved? How can I ever know for certain I'm secure? And then up and down and up and down, and and this pattern ensues. And in your life, you just never have this peace, or you never feel like you have this peace that you can walk back to and say, all right, when I have those moments of fear, when I have those moments of danger, I can rest here. I can go back to this truth, these truths. So that's what the book of 1 John is all about. And and we're going through in chapter 2, we're still continuing a section on sin this week and next week are on sin, and not from, the, not from the perspective that you might think. Sometimes uh, as preachers, we can uh, poke people in the eye with sin, right, and say, uh, how dare you do these things, and God wants you to be holy. You're going to see that today as well. But really, for you to understand what sin does in your life, to be able to see this is the type of thing that I do, and what does it do to me? Sometimes we think that there is no consequences to our sin, and we may think that we found the perfect sin that, that no one else knows about. It doesn't harm anyone, and I'm telling you the nature of sin is your adversary, and you're going to see some things that it does to you. But today, we get to see one of the most famous verses, I think, uh, one of the most powerful promises, one of the most um, awesome verses that we could just really rest on. So I'm going to start off by reading in First John chapter 2, and if you look at verse 1 with me, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. I want to ask you this morning, you can see that word there in the middle of verse 2 of the advocate. I wonder if you've ever needed an advocate. Now, I'm not asking you to confess this out loud if you've ever needed a legal advocate, but sometimes an advocate's not even a lawyer or anything like that. Sometimes it's just someone who advocates on our behalf. I had this uh, trip one time. I've told before about my really rigorous military history, right? First, I went to Tampa, Florida, so, so difficult. I, I'm, you're grateful, I know, that I did that for my country. Well, they also sent me to England and Germany. <laughs> it's also really rough and not during uh, D-Day or anything. So uh, it, it was when Europe was at peace and it was a, a really nice time. So if you've ever done any overseas travel, 
there's some things that you can think of that would be like your worst case scenario, right? Well, I had a trip or a, a really good trip, but there was one day where it seemed like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. I, I just tell you the start and the stop, and then I'm going to cover the middle a little bit. So at the start, we, uh, the roads are there, over there are just so narrow in London. You're driving through London, and there's cars just parked alongside the road. And if you had a smaller car, not a big deal. But we got, you know, a normal size American car. And so we're going down this tiny little road. And I just look over at the guy driving. I was on the wrong side, of course, uh, because that's how they drive there. And uh, I look over at him driving, and I just say, hey, you're getting really close to these cars that are parked just alongside the road. And he says, what can I do? I, I'm, I'm on the line here. Well, I was like, hey, I'm telling you, you're like so close. I'm talking inches. Before we knew it, our side view mirror blew up because it hit a car on the side of the road. So that was the start. The end of it, we're in a cab of a tow truck. That tells you a little bit about how the day went. We're in the cab of a tow truck. And we're pulling up to the rental car station, and all of a sudden the driver goes, oh no, oh no, oh no. Well, that's terrifying after the day we had. And we look back, and the gate had actually closed on our car. <laughs> he didn't know that if you go in, the gate may close behind the tow truck and not wait for the car that it's actually towing. So it closes on our tow truck. But that wasn't the worst part of this trip. So... It's in the middle of the day, and we had had a really good trip. We went up to northern London, uh, northern England. I got to go to Warwick Castle and see a real-life trebuchet. Anybody know what a trebuchet even is? A few people, okay. They're those big wooden objects that throw bricks and, uh, and stones at castles, right? I got to see one fire in England. That was a highlight of my day. So really good time. I got to see Buckingham Palace. I uh, saw Windsor Castle. And it was at Windsor, this is, I guess, where a lot of times the royal family actually stays. It's at Windsor that the story took a downturn. <laughs> so we're in Windsor, and they have these beautiful uh, brick roads. Beautiful. But the curbs are also brick. Now, if you know anything about brick, you know the edge is kind of sharp. It's not like a nice sanded off edge, right, where, it's, where it's, you could run up against that thing. No, 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 it's a sharp brick. So I have the same conversation that I'd had at the beginning of the day where I said to my friend, hey man, we're getting kind of close to the side here. Well, this time it's not cars that are going to explode our side view mirror. This time it's sharp brick that I can see like this far from our tire. So I said, hey man, we're getting kind of close to these bricks. Or again, same conversation. What can I do? I'm right here on the middle line. There's nowhere I can go. Say, so, all right, well, I'm just telling you, remember last time, it didn't work out well. This time it's brick. So before we know, hair pop, our tire goes flat. We pull over on the side of the road. So if you're in a, and this was before cell phones were so good. So we're worried, do we even have signal? Can we even call for help? My phone didn't work. Thankfully, his phone did work. And so he calls for a tow truck. We're just sitting there. Luckily, it was a beautiful day. We're just sitting there on the side of the road. It was sometime just a little afternoon. So we're sitting there on the side of the road, and uh, we're just waiting for this tow truck. Well, a couple hours go by. We're just sitting there. All right, well, we can't be too gripey. We're, hit, we're here in England. Uh, you know, other people have traveled for the country to much worse places and had much worse things happen. So, hey, we're going to be grateful. Uh, so I should mention this. We checked, of course, to see if there was a, stair, a spare tire. There was not one. There was nothing to change our tire in this vehicle. So we're waiting there for a couple hours, and all of a sudden, this van pulls up. We're like, hey, finally, it's, a, it, it's the person who's here to help us. Now, we did know it was a van, not a tow truck. Would have liked a tow truck, but that's okay. Maybe he has a tire. Well, he gets out. He doesn't go do anything in his van. He just walks up to the back of our vehicle. He opens the trunk like he's looking for something, and he looks in there. He goes, oh, you don't have a spare. Yeah, that's true. That's why we called you. Otherwise, we would have changed the spare tire ourselves. So he says, well, I don't have one. So what well, can you at least tow us? He goes, no. So we said, all right, we just waited a couple hours for you to come and check for our spare tire. We would have changed it. I don't know what you think of Americans, but we could have changed the spare tire in this multiple hour time that we've been waiting here. I would have tried to find enough people to lift the car if we didn't have a jack. We would have gotten a tire on this thing. So, so we're sitting there just a little frustrated, right? Understandably, I think. We had had a side view mirror blow up. I mean, an entire blow up is, is a rough day there in Windsor, England. So, 
So he says, well, hey, it's shift change. I can't go get one. I'm about to go off clock. And remember this, this is the real culprit, shift change. This is what happened. So, so he ends up leaving, and uh, he says, I'll send the next guy with a flatbed that can tow you since you don't have a, a spare tire. So we wait there a couple more hours. Now, mind you, this happened at like 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, it was like 6 p.m., 7 p.m., something like that. And, uh, and then all of a sudden this other van pulls up. Not a tow truck. <laughs> Not a tow truck. Now, you may know where this is going, but do you know what he did when he got out of his van? He did not go. He did not go to the back of his van and get a tire for us. That's not what he did. He walks up. He walks over to our car. He opens up our trunk, and he says, you don't have a tire. We know that. We know we don't have a tire. Do you have a tire? Please tell me you have a tire. Like, we've been sitting here all this time. He goes, no, I don't have a tire. He was like, you have to send us a truck. Please send us a truck. We can't be stuck here. We're supposed to be in Germany tomorrow. Our flight is at like 4 a.m. You have to, have to get us a truck. He goes, oh, well, I can tow you. And we said, you can tow us. You have a van. He goes, oh, yeah, all these vans are equipped with an ability to tow. <laughs> that other guy knew it was close to shift change, and so he left us there on the side of the road. So what I'm telling you is sometimes we need an advocate. Sometimes we need someone who wants to help us. Someone who wants to help us. I want you to see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, look at it again. He says, my little children. This is the first of like 14 times he's going to say the word children, partially because he's older, but also because to some of them he's a spiritual father. He says, I'm writing you these things. Again, we take note anytime in Scripture where he tells us he's writing these things for this purpose. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. Now, as we've gone through 1 John in the first four verses, we've seen that John is a witness to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is life eternal, that you have to have faith in him and follow him to have eternal life. But then we saw in verses 5 through 7 the nature of God and how our own personalities are diametrically opposed to God's. Meaning God is light and in him is no darkness, but there's darkness in us. And so he says, if you say that you have fellowship with God, but you walk in darkness, you are lying and you're not practicing the truth. And that's what we do sometimes. Sometimes we say, oh yeah, I'm good with God, but then we keep these little things with our life that we're not surrendering to God. And we just say, I'm going to live how I want, but also be good with God. And he says, no, God is light and in him is no darkness. Therefore, I can't have this fellowship with him if I'm walking in darkness. So that's, that's one side of it. But then he goes on in verses 8 and verses 10. And he says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. So you have these two almost opposite false beliefs. You got one false belief that says, I can have fellowship with God and yet have sin. And you have this other one that says, I actually don't even have any sin. And there are two false beliefs. So this is a difficulty for us Christians because we may say, well, okay, I can't have darkness in my life. That means I have to be perfect, doesn't it? Does that mean I have to be perfect? Well, but then you say, if I claim that I'm perfect, I'm lying and not practicing the truth. So where's this middle ground that I'm supposed to walk? It feels like I've got two just polar opposites, and I'm not allowed to go to either of those, so what do I do? Well, what we have to realize, first of all, is he says in verse, verse 1 of chapter 2, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. The first point in your notes is this, God doesn't want you to sin. This is why we need an advocate. God doesn't want you to sin. There may be a Christian here today who is like 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, that think, I can just live how I want. After all, God made me this way. I am just this way. So I'll just live this way, and God's going to be okay with it. And we would be wrong if we missed this, that he is writing this so that you may not sin. He doesn't want you to sin. God doesn't want you to sin. Whatever it is in your life, Christian, whatever it is in your life that you haven't surrendered to the lordship, the authority of God, he wants it out of your life. Don't mistake his grace for a desire to leave you in sin. He saves you so that you can be a new creation. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to be a new creature. He wants you to be an ambassador for him. He wants you to point other people to him and his holiness and his goodness. That's what he wants from you. So we need an advocate. 
because you are going to sin, and you have. And maybe there's someone here who's not a Christian. I want you to know this about God as well, that he doesn't want you to sin. But he knows you have. And in fact, this sin in your life has separated you from him. And it will separate you from him for all eternity in a real place called hell if you don't surrender to him today. So, God doesn't want you to sin, therefore we need an advocate. We need a God who wants to save us because there is sin in our life, and yet we have a God who is holy, and so we need him to advocate for us. So what does God do? Well, we had in 1 John 1, 9, you can look at that if you can turn really easy. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, we see that. It's an awesome memory verse. It's, it's really good. I hope you rest on that. But, but you may say then, well, why an advocate? Why do I need an advocate at all if he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Now, when we were there on the side of Windsor, England, on the side of the road, the reason we were helpless is because we didn't have a tire right? We didn't have a tire. We didn't have a jack. We didn't have the things necessary to do the job. We didn't have what ordinarily, if we had had those two tools, we could have fixed up the tire and we could have been on our way and we wouldn't have been at the mercy of someone else. I wonder if you've ever had this in a project where you know you need a specific tool and you're working on it, working on it, and you're like, I just wish I had this specific tool. Ladies, this is why guys need to go to Lowe's sometimes or one of the hardware stores. It's a biblical principle I'm trying to teach you. No, okay. I'm not going to get blasphemous. Um, But if you ever had that experience where you're working on something and just the the right tool makes the job so simple, but without that tool, it's almost an impossibility to do this job. So we were in England. We were helpless without a tire. Why do we need an advocate? Why are we helpless before God? Well, I have several verses. They're on your notes or they're going to be on the screen. So Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, talking about Satan, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. Satan is known as many things, the the great dragon, the great serpent, um, all sorts of different names, the great deceiver. He's an accuser. Satan is before God accusing the brethren, accusing this word brothers and sisters. You sometimes see brothers, sometimes you see brothers and sisters. It's Adelphos, it's the brethren, it's the Christians. Satan is accusing Christians of sin before God. Now look at John chapter 5. It's on your notes or on the screen. It says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Now, Jesus saying this to Jewish people, that's a tough thing to swallow, right? Because Moses is, like he says, it's on whom they set their hope. He says, Your accuser is Moses. Now, that may be weird to you. You may be thinking, Well, how does Moses accuse people? Well, that's the next couple verses. In Galatians chapter 3, I'm actually going to skip verse 21. Just look at verse 22. This is how Moses accuses us. It says, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power. Now, that's not what you think of the Bible, probably. You think of the Bible as, man, this is God's word. It's a thing that points me to truth. It's a a thing that uh, gives me hope and all those things. And it is that. But that's step two. Step one is, is our condition before God. This says, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. So do you hear what scripture does? The more we read scripture, the more we're able to examine ourselves and realize that we fall short of a holy God. The more we see his standard, the more we get to, it's like, uh, we'll cover James probably this year or next, but but it's like that famous passage that says you look in a, a glass dimly, right? It, like that. It, it's like uh, you, you go look at yourself and you're looking in this mirror and you turn away and you're, you're not able to see who you once were in James chapter 1. So what this is like is like a, a low definition mirror. It's a mirror that we're looking at ourself and we can't really see ourselves. But the more we read scripture, 
the more we come into high definition. The more we look at Scripture, the more we see the sinfulness that we have, that we are. The more we're able to see ourselves. And when we see ourselves, look at verse 22 again. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power. Now, how does it do that? Look at Romans chapter 3 on your notes or on the screen. Verse 19. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law. Whatever the law says, the law of God, the law of Moses, this is why you could say Moses accuses you, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. Do you hear that? This is that picture I've tried to portray that one day everybody who has never named the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will stand before a holy God and they'll, they'll look at God and, and it's like this moment when we try to excuse ourselves. We try to make up, a, oh, I did this because of that or it's their fault or starting from the beginning what Adam said, the woman who you gave me, right? The sin of man started with excuses and it's continued. We have all these excuses, but there's going to be a moment when, when a non-believer stands before God and says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. So when we see in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, my little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You need an advocate because we have an accuser. We have an accuser in Satan, but then we have an accuser in God's own word, his own law. It paints us as guilty. It, it shows a picture, and you know it yourself. You violate your own laws. I violate my own, my own rules, my own standards. We all do those types of things. But in Scripture, as we go to examine ourselves, we find very quickly how many things are wrong with us. The more we read this, we say, yeah, I don't measure up to that. Yeah, I don't measure up to that. And that's one thing to acknowledge here. But one day when you stand before God, if you're apart from Christ, it'll mean everything. It'll mean eternity. So this law came in so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may be subject to God's judgment because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. We are helpless. Like I was on a, a road in England without a tire. I was helpless. I didn't have the right thing. We're helpless, guilty before God. But the second point in your notes is, but Jesus advocates for us. You have an advocate. Like I didn't have an advocate from that first guy, right? He didn't, he didn't advocate for me. He, he didn't care if I had to sit there for another six hours. He was fine. You have a God who doesn't want you to sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. You have the same God that says, I have this holy standard, and no one shall enter my kingdom if you fall short of this holy standard, but we have an advocate who says, Jesus Christ, as we're going to see in a second, I paid for those things. I'm arguing on their behalf. They're mine. They were purchased by the blood of the Lamb, bought at an immeasurable, an infinite price of the life of the Son of God. He says, they are mine. They are my sheep. And they know me and they hear my voice. And he doesn't lose any of his sheep. He says, they are mine. You have an advocate. Don't mistake the fact that you need an advocate. And there may be someone here today who is in sin apart from Christ, meaning you've never professed faith in Jesus Christ. You're sitting there right now, and you're just hoping to get into heaven on your own by the things that you've done, by your own holiness or goodness. And I'm telling you, you don't have enough. You can't have enough. You will never have enough. You could spend the rest of your life not sinning, but if you've already sinned, you're already separated. You need an advocate, and there's only one advocate, and that is Jesus. It says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. God doesn't want you to sin. But if anyone does sin, you have an advocate with the Father. So the next thing that we may wonder is how can he advocate for us if God is holy and we are guilty? Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you're a non-Christian here today. And you feel like there's no way a God could stand up for you because you're a sinner apart from him and you know the grotesqueness of your sin. I'm telling you, he does too. But you know it and you feel it. 
And so that feeling inside you keeps you from surrendering to him because you feel unworthy to be saved. And maybe there's a Christian here today who this is the reason you continually doubt because you sin and you say, can my faith actually be real? I've, I've messed up again. I hate it. It's in my life. I, I messed up again. I, I hate this sin. I, I, I wish it were out of my life. I wish I didn't fall back. As the Old Testament says, so a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's how you feel. And it's caused you all sorts of unease because you just feel like, I, I, I keep stumbling into this. And, and, and how could a holy God ever welcome me in? Well, we get to see some beautiful stuff here. Look in chapter 2 and verse 1 again. But look at the last part of it. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He names who this advocate is. Jesus Christ. He doesn't just stop there. He says, the righteous one. Because our advocate had to be righteous. First, he says this because he is righteous, but also because he had to be righteous. Here's why. Look at verse 2. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The atoning sacrifice. So he calls him the righteous one, and then he says the atoning sacrifice. Or some, some uh, translations, anybody have a translation that says propitiation? Anybody have a few of you? Okay. Similar, similar word, similar meaning, same Greek word. And it's the same root word as we're going to see on the screen, mercy seat. So if you would pull up uh, Romans 3 on the screen, and it's in your notes. Romans 3, verse 23. So this is Romans 3, 23 is one of the, uh, it's the first of the, the Roman road verses that if you want to lead someone to Christ, it's the very first message I preached here. And it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you should have gotten that by now today and in previous messages, but also today, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've fallen short of his standard. Verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, that was a whole lot of hefty words, right? Justified freely means declared not guilty. Well, how? Through the redemption. Oh, man, there's another word. Redeem means to buy back. So we're justified freely or declared not guilty through his redemption. He bought us back from our sin, from our death, that is in Christ, the only one who can do it. Now, look at verse 25. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him, talking about Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at, that, at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Now that was a lot as well. What I want us to focus on is the word mercy seat. I think they're going to pull up a, a slide, a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. And so... Okay, it's up there. I, I looked at the side screens. <laughs> so the Holman Dictionary describes the mercy seat as a slab of pure gold that set atop the Ark of the Covenant, which was the same size. It was the base for the golden cherubim and symbolized the throne from which God ruled Israel. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest sprinkled the blood of a sacrificial lamb on the mercy seat as a plea for forgiveness for the sins of the nation. The Hebrew word literally means to wipe out or to cover. So these are all roots of the same word when you see mercy seat, so the gold slab at top, where blood would be sprinkled for the remission of sins, for the temporary remission of sins. We'll look again at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He himself is the atoning, atoning sacrifice for our sins. So again, these words, if you see atoning sacrifice, if you see propitiation, if you see mercy seat, what this does is when blood is sprinkled up there, because the wages of sin is death, something has to die. So when we sin, it causes death. And so that means blood. Now, I've often thought this. Sometimes we're so used to a, a fast food world that we forget sometimes the cost of life. That, that when you go to a restaurant and you have a nice uh, chicken finger or something like that, that that came from a chicken. A chicken had to die for that thing. We're so far removed that we forget that life comes out of death. That, that something has to die to sustain you, even if it's a plant. Something has to die to sustain you. And for eternal life, something has to die. And back then it was bulls and goats and things like that. 
They would sprinkle the blood, and God would atone or remit their sins for a time. And what this is saying is Jesus is that for us. The Old Testament system had, had the, the animals, things like that, but they were temporary. We're going to see that in a second. They were temporary. What this is saying is that Jesus became that for us. Now, what's an amazing thing, look at these verses again in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. Well, why doesn't he want us to sin? Because he died for your sins. If you ever wonder how much he cares about whether or not there is sin in your life, he died for your sins. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Well, who advocates for you? The same one who died for you. The same, the same one who laid down his life, who became the blood of the mercy seat, the propitiation, the atonement. The same one who does those things is also your advocate. So do you see the picture there? When the accuser, Satan, or the accuser, Scripture, when you're reading through Scripture, what your heart ought to say is you say, man, I've done these things wrong, or, or God saying, I don't measure up. Okay, well, he died so that you would walk in light. So confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to cleanse and forgive all unrighteousness. Confess it to him and start walking in purity. And when you stumble again, confess again. But actually confess, because he cares so much about your sin, he died for it. But here's what our heart ought to hear. When we say, I've sinned, so therefore God couldn't have anything to do with me, you ought to hear, you have an advocate. You have the advocate who paid for your sins. The one who says, who says I gave my life for that. You ever spend money on something and see someone tarnish it? You still care about that thing. God spent his life on you. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. He cares about you. He, he wants you to know that Christian, when sometimes you stumble into sin, he is your advocate standing before the Father and standing in your heart saying, God, I'm worthless. I, I, I keep messing up. I keep falling down. He says, I paid for that. I paid for that. I paid, whatever it is, whatever thing's in your mind right now, he's saying, I paid for that. Rest in my, my sacrifice. Have faith in it. Trust it. That's what trust, that's what faith and trust really mean. It's, it's God saying, I did this for you. Trust me. Now, that doesn't mean I'm just going to stay living in sin. I'm just going to stay walking the way the world would have me walk, walking the way that my sinful flesh would have me walk. It doesn't mean to stay doing those things, but what it means is if you truly profess faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of your life, He has paid for it, and He advocates on your behalf, and sometimes He has to do that to your own heart to say, I have paid for whatever it is that's bogging you down. Whatever it's Whatever it is that's keeping you from fully surrendering to me, I paid for it. I paid for it on the cross with my life. I care so much about you. I don't want you to sin, but when you sin, I'm your advocate. I'm the one going to bat for you saying, no, you were never worthy, but I love you anyway. Whatever it is in your life, I love you anyway. Whatever it is, cast it aside. Throw away the burdens, the chains, the, the addictions. Throw those things away and live for me, not because of obligation, but because I love you. I love you so much. I died for you. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the only one who is equipped to be the sacrifice for our sins because a sinful person couldn't die for you. They could just die for themselves and face the punishment. It had to be Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, I have one more passage I want to look at before I finish this off. Hebrews chapter 10 is on the screen or in your notes. And this is the beautiful picture I want you to see of the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says this. Since the law has only a shadow of good things to come and not the reality of itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. So you hear that. People would come, give sacrifice to God. They'd, uh, even the high priest sprinkling blood on the, the uh, mercy seat. Even that, he says, it could never fully perfect. He says... They continue to offer it year after year. They had to keep doing it. Verse 2, look at it with me. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? I love when the Bible is just so rational that it just speaks our language. That, that's the type of thing that almost a kid points out, right? Well, if the blood of the goats and the, the ox, if they work, then why do you have to keep doing it? Right? That's a kid's acknowledgement. That's something that's like, wow, a kid is saying the thing we're all thinking. 
So does Scripture. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? Look at the middle of verse 2. Since the worshipers, purified once and for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in the sacrifice, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. This is talking about the limited impact of the Old Testament system. But now look at verse 11. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Well, who is sanctified? Someone who has professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. You don't have to have something sacrificed for you next year. There has been one sacrifice once and for all, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's advocating for you, saying, I paid for that. Whatever it is in your life, Christian, that's bogging you down, that's made you ashamed, made you feel guilty, made you feel like you cannot live for the Lord, confess it to him, and he is faithful and just to cleanse and forgive all unrighteousness because he paid for that. Because he paid for whatever it is in your mind right now, your heart right now, your guiltiness right now. So here's what I want the Christian to do right now. Offer it up to him. And trust him in faith and say, God, you say you paid for it. Sometimes I still feel so guilty so dirty, so filthy from this world. I've got this sin that I, I've been struggling with, but, but I profess you as my Lord and my Savior. And so, God, I believe that you paid for it. Help me walk in the liberty of faith. Help me walk in the freedom that is in Jesus Christ and the victory that is in Jesus Christ. I'm told that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. If we are more than conquerors, God, help me feel like a conqueror by resting in your so great a salvation. Help me feel like that by resting in the salvation that you provided for me freely. But then there's a non-Christian here today, and I want you to see the rest of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. You know that phrase, the whole world? It's holos cosmos in the Greek. And I'll just warn you of this. I know I'm new to being your pastor. I'm from Missouri, too. I don't pronounce things right. So just, just assume that. It's the same phrase, though, in the Greek as John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That's the cosmos. Is that a big enough place for you? Is that a big enough thing for God to care about? Are you in that? For God so loved the whole world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't want you to sin because when you sin, you stand guilty before him, but he died on your behalf. Everyone, the whole world, he died for everyone. That doesn't mean everyone gets it for free. Look what it says again. God loved the whole world in this way. He gave his one and only son. So does everybody get saved? No, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have ever to eternal life. There is a non-Christian here today, someone who has never trusted Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. I'm asking you today to change that. Today. Today, make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. What you have to do is recognize you are a sinner before him. You have to admit that your sins separate you from him, but also you need to believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for you and rose again and make him the Lord, the master of your life. I mean, you give authority to him. You're going to still mess up, but you have an advocate for the Father. But you're going to walk in a new life. Like I've been talking to these Christians here today, walk in obedience to him, not out of obligation, but out of love. Because he loves you so much, he died for you. So if there is someone here today who hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we're going to have some pastors up here this morning, and there's going to be an opportunity for you to come talk to them. Come talk to them and say, how can I be saved? And they would be happy to lead you to Christ. They'd be happy to lead you to salvation so that once and for all, you can know that you have eternal life with him. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for all the people in this room. As I always do, I lift up the Christians and the non-Christians. I pray for my Christian brothers and sisters. I pray that this is a, a memory verse, that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
that God, you're sitting there, the son is sitting at the right hand of the father saying, I paid for that. Whatever it is, whatever's on the mind of a Christian here this morning, whatever's on the heart of a Christian here this morning, you paid for it. God, I pray there is a Christian who is feeling liberty in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Not liberty to go do whatever they want, but freedom, unchained from sin, to live a life of joy and holiness and peace with an eternal God. To realize that when we fall down, you are the one who picks us up. We just have to reach out our hand and grab yours. You're always waiting. You're always faithful and just to cleanse and forgive all unrighteousness when we confess. So God, I pray for a Christian this morning that has struggled with sin. I pray, one, that they do not sin, that they seek to get it out of their life, not out of just behavior modification, but out of heart transformation that seeks to live holy for you. And for someone here who is a non-Christian that's sitting in their seat right now, and the weight of their sin is bearing down on them, and they know that it separates them from you, God, I pray for that individual right now that they wouldn't let guilt keep them away, that they would come running to a loving Father who loves so much that he died for them. Because if they don't, they will forever have to bear a penalty that they can't bear on their own. They'll forever bear the penalty for sin, and that's death in this life and the next. But they don't have to. It's not easy to be a Christian, but it is easy to become one. You do want all of us, but you'll take all of us. I pray for that person this morning to come up, talk to a pastor, and give their life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.